Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast. On today's episode, the Meat Mafia is joined by Tucker Goodrich. Tucker is an ex-Wall Street executive who developed a passion for health when he ran into his own gastrointestinal troubles. He has since become an advocate for removing seed oils from your diet, and he's widely known as one of the expert voices in the space. He's currently an advisor to Zero Acre Farms, a company focused on creating a seed oil substitute. His knowledge of everything related to seed oils and their negative effects on the body is remarkable, and we dive into the basics of understanding why seed oil should be removed from the human diet. Enjoy. All right, we are rolling here with another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast, joined today by Tucker Goodrich, uh, well known on Twitter for his knowledge around seed oil. So we're really excited to dive deep on that topic today with Tucker. Tucker, what's going on? Uh, having a great morning. It's a pleasure to meet you guys. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, it's uh, we're we're honored to have you here too. It's a uh, it's a shame that we couldn't get Dr. Curley. We'll have to do uh, we'll have to do an episode with both of you guys together since you're partners in crime. It seems like right. Yes, that would be great. Yeah, we yeah, he's, we we have also started. I started up a podcast, and he's uh, my co-host uh, for that. For we're you know lining up some interviews and all that, so that's going to be a lot of fun. That's a that's going to be a great resource for a lot of people because. I know the people on Twitter that we come across, most people are well aware of what's happening in the world of seed oils and how it's coming more prevalent in the conversation around personal health. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a lot of people out there who are just fairly oblivious to all the seed oils that are in the products out there or, or being cooked with uh, at restaurants. And we know that you had your own personal journey with some gastrointestinal issues um, I'd be curious to maybe get that story of how you really got into all this, because you are definitely a loud voice in the, the anti-seed oil space. Yeah, uh, well, I will start off by saying I had no interest in diet or any of this stuff. I grew up with a mother who was on Weight Watchers and watched her enjoy the Weight, Watcher, the Weight Watchers roller coaster of, you know, going up and down and, you know, it doesn't work in the long term. Right. So I presumed that the dietary guidelines were probably pretty well founded and other than observing that there was no evolutionary basis for thinking that saturated fats could be harmful I pretty much followed that and you know as I realized later on I was following it following the dietary guidelines a lot more than I thought I was because there's lots of hidden fats in your diet that you don't really have control over unless you're consciously trying to control what you eat. So I was 38 years old. I had what was initially thought to be a stroke, which put me in a stroke ward for four days. Wow. Um, two years later, when I was 40, I had uh, an attack of acute diverticulitis, which was actually my second such attack, I later realized. Um, Acute diverticulitis basically means a perforated colon. Uh, it's the most painful thing I've experienced in my life, and it can be fatal. Luckily, I had a really good surgeon who knew how to handle it based on some papers that were written about gunshot victims in the Iraq war. <laughs> uh, so I wound up having to have a surgery uh, that I was told would be curative. I had eight inches of my colon removed. Um, about six months after the initial attack, as things just kept getting worse and worse. Um, and then I kept having, unfortunately, the problem persisted. Um, so a cu couple of years later, at that point, I'd be about 42. Um, I got introduced to this whole diet world by a fellow who convinced me that this was something uh, that I should pay attention to. And a couple of months after that, hit one of his biggest issues was seed oils. And one day I was, you know, in the cafeteria at work, got to the end of the salad bar. And I mean, I ate pretty healthy. Um, and I looked at these squeeze bottles of salad dressings and I was like, these have got to be the nastiest, cheapest oils known to man. What happens to me if I stop eating them? Mm -hmm. And so just at the end of the salad bar, I'd made that decision. And at that point I had had irritable bowel syndrome, you know, verging into diverticulitis, uh, 
the number one symptom was chronic diarrhea for about 16 years. And that resolved in two days after I dropped seed oils out of my diet. And it absolutely blew my mind because this was just something I assumed was my life. And, you know, so I started taking diet, learning about diet seriously. I was a chief technology officer at a big New York hedge fund and largely self-taught. So I wanted to understand what was going on because I knew from my professional experience that if you don't understand something, you're not really in control of it. Um, so I started doing research and started talking to people at work. My health rapidly turned around. I lost my extra weight in two months, dropped about 15 years off my visual age, you know, looking at my face, everybody at work started asking me what I was doing because I looked so much different. And I started realizing that, you know, even the conversations I had at work were having significant positive effects on people's health. So I just kind of kept at it. <laughs> Here I am. It's 12 funny. years later. You're not the first person who said, I mean, two days and you already notice your body reacting more positively to just eliminating certain foods. Like we've spoken to people similarly, like took an elimination approach and within like a week, I know Nick Norwood said his, yeah. his uh, issues with colitis were basically gone after a week of eliminating some of these mm -hmm. more inflammatory foods, specifically seed oils. So I, I just find it amazing how quickly your body can change just when through eliminating some of these really harmful uh, foods that, are just very common stake today? Well, I mean, think about what happened with my colon resection. They took eight inches of my colon, my sigmoid colon out, right? Sewed the two ends of the tube back together. And in two and a half days, per doctor's instructions, I went to a pool party and was eating hamburgers and beer. Wow. That's how fast it heals, That's right? It, so yeah, it's... It, you know, with that context, it shouldn't be that surprising that once you take the harmful item out of your diet, that your gut health is going to improve very quickly. It can take longer than that. It's not going to work that way for everybody. But, you know, I, I know my case, Nick's case, Brian Curley's case, we all, and I've heard lots of other people say the same thing. We all started improving pretty quickly once we fixed our diet. Yeah, I don't think people are fully understand until you actually go through an experience with IBS or some other type of autoimmune condition, just how debilitating that can be. I'm similar to Nick, we have a weird coincidence where we, I have, I've had ulcerative colitis for six years, used a meat-based ap approach to pretty much heal it, get off all medication. And when you have IBS or colitis or Crohn's, I don't know if it was similar for you, but a lot of people, it's like your life is kind of revolving around, hey, where are the bathrooms? And like, yes. it's, not, it's not a great way to go through life. So for you to have 16 years of that, and then two days later, wow, I feel oh, great. It was, it's insane, right? It, it was insane. I was totally blown away. I mean, I go back and I look at the email I sent to the guy who got me on going on this thing. And I was just like, you know, I can't believe I'm better. This is un incredible, right? So, yeah. And then I started seeing all these other benefits that, you know, I mean, the weight loss was, I had tried, you know, like anybody who's gained weight, um, you know, I started gaining weight about the same time I got started getting sick with IBS mm. and had tried the usual things, including a low carb diet to, try and get back to normal body weight. And that happened two months. So in two months, I put a, my pants and my belt on in the morning, getting ready to go to work. I let go and they fell to my ankles, right? Without trying to do anything. Right. <laughs> and wound up having to go, you know, take all my sports coats and my dress pants to a tailor, yeah. <laughs> which was pretty expensive, but a very good problem to have. It's a great expense. Yeah. It's a great expense. Need yeah. a whole new wardrobe. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, you know, and then, I mean, we could do an hour podcast just on all my health issues, but everything's gotten better. And I fired my very expensive doctor, you know, like a year and a half later, because I just didn't need him anymore. And, you know, 12 years later, I, you know, I'm healthy, period.
T Tucker, when did you start writing about seed oils and the harmful effects? Was it something that you were looking to share right away? Because obviously it helped you a ton. I was in, I was very active in a barefoot running Google uh, email group at mm. the time. And we talked about diet, you know, because if you're a runner, your diet's pretty significant in how you perform. And I started describing things there and people started experimenting. And one of the people in that group uh, was a woman who had fibromyalgia. And I started looking into fibromyalgia, just trying to understand her situation and realized it was pretty clearly connected to seed oil consumption. And she was able to put her fibromyalgia, which is an autoimmune condition that can be quite debilitating uh, into remission in a fairly short period of time. And that was when I started realizing, wow, this is, you know, more than just my issues. And I mean, I had my own autoimmune issues that are gone now. Um, so, you know, I mean, my wife now has suffered from fibromyalgia for 30 years and was able to put it into remission pretty completely um, by fixing her diet at my suggestion mm -hmm. uh, back before we got married when we, you know, were getting together. So it's powerful. Yeah. And that's a condition where there's no treatment and no cure and no explanation as to why it happens in the medical literature, mm -hmm. unless you can read between the lines. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You continue to just see it. That's the amazing thing about the internet is the connection point that it builds where people are able to share just more and more of these anecdotal experiences. And it's like, all right, well, how many anecdotal experiences do you need to see to realize that there's a clear correlation between the food that you're choosing to put into your system and then the outputs that are actually occurring from that? It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, <clears throat> Tucker, just for someone in our audience that may not be as familiar down and have gone down the seed oil rabbit hole, do you mind just giving a quick definition on just what seed oils actually are and mm -hmm. why they should be concerned with, with these things and how bad they are for you? Yeah, so as we call, we say seed oils to distinguish them from the vegetable oils, right, which would include so a seed oil is an oil that's made from the seed of some plant, right? Like corn or soybean or cotton seed. Um, this is distinguished from things like an olive, right? Olive is the fruit of, you know, the oil is mostly made from the fruit of the olive, not the pit. Or avocado, where it's made from the fruit of the avocado, mostly not the pit. Um, the different types of oils have very different fatty acid compositions, right? The types of fats that make up the oil. And what we're concerned about specifically is omega-6 fats and one called linoleic acid, which in certain types of seed oils comprises, you know, up to 70% of the oil. Mm -hmm. um, in a fat like olive oil, that can be as low as 2%. In animal fats, it's typically 1% or thereabouts for something that's fed a natural diet. So what we've seen over the 20th century as we've started consuming seed oils is a rapid increase in the linoleic acid content of the diet. And that uh, has uh, correlated to a rapid increase in what we call chronic diseases, diseases of civilization, Western diseases. There are a bunch of different names that people use. And those are, um, type two diabetes, heart disease, cancer, um, autoimmune diseases, you know, there's this whole suite of things that tend to come along when a population starts consuming what I like to call the modern American diet. Um, the signature component of which is a high intake of omega-6 fats in the form of linoleic acid. What is it about linoleic acid specifically that causes harm to the body in the abundance that it is in these seed oils because it's obviously not bad in certain quantities but when it's 70 percent of the fatty acid content clearly our bodies aren't reacting to that properly based on your story so is there more like a scientific view on that that like the basic listener should try to understand yes so linoleic acid is what they call a polyunsaturated fat um 
you know, this is what the fats that are in fish oils, um, a poly, without getting too much into it, a polyunsaturated fat is a fat that is effectively missing some hydrogen atoms. So if you look at a picture of a saturated fat, it's a string of carbon atoms and to every carbon atom are attached a couple of hydrogen atoms, right? A unsaturated fat is missing one hydrogen atom, like the fat in olive oil. A polyunsaturated fat is missing two or more hydrogen ions, atoms. And what this means is that these fats are more susceptible to an oxygen molecule, an oxygen atom coming in and attaching itself to the fat, breaking the fat into components. And these components are very bioactive and often toxic in the body. Um, the one I generally talk about and has been a key part of the research that I've done is one called hydroxynonanol, which is basically half of a linoleic acid uh, molecule broken in half by a uh, oxidation by an oxygen atom. That is a highly toxic aldehyde, right? We've all heard of formaldehyde, what they use mm -hmm. to embalm dead people. Well, they use formaldehyde to embalm dead people because it's highly toxic and it kills the things that would otherwise cause your body to rot, right? Um, hydroxynonanol or HNE is another aldehyde that's also highly toxic. And it, the uh, omega-6 fats in seed oils break down into that toxin and a number of other toxins when we cook in our body, when they're sitting on the shelf. Um, so that's a normal process, right? Um, and our body has evolved defense mechanisms to deal with this process. What seems to be the case is that because we're so consuming so much more of these fats that we're overwhelming our body's antioxidant defense mechanism um, that evolved to protect us from that. So to give you an idea of how important this is, the main antioxidant defense against uh, HNE is uh, called glutathione. If an animal is born unable to produce glutathione, it won't survive to be birthed. It will die as a fetus, right? Um, so one of the signature hallmarks of what I like to call seed oil toxicity is a decreased level of glutathione in the body because as these omega-6 fats break down, glutathione changes into um, an oxidized version of glutathione. It's sacrificing itself, basically. And it can, we only have so much of it. And if too much of it is damaged, then you can't protect yourself against these toxins. And I mean, you know, toxin sounds a little extreme. They are, you know, they kill cells, they cause DNA damage, they cause, you know, a number of the mutations that are typical of the modern suite of cancers, like, you know, breast cancer, uh, colon cancer. Um, so it's seems to be a significant problem. And there's a vast literature, hundreds of thousands of studies looking at these processes. Um, unfortunately, seems like in the United States, there's a big political push to, how should I say this, ignore <laughs> the literature showing harm, um, going all the way back to, you know, a bunch of big studies that were done in the 60s, looking at seed oils and heart disease. Um, and we can get into that too. Hmm. Is it true that it can take 17 steps from to actually get from seed to bottle that, that you're purchasing in a store? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because if you look at seed oils, like soybean oil, to make a soybean is not a greasy thing, right? I mean, it's not like if you have a steak or something, it leaves a fat residue, right? So they've got to use an industrial process involving chemicals that are so toxic that you can't order them and have them shipped to your house. I found a really funny recipe online on how to produce, how to make soybean oil at home. And it's effectively illegal to do it because the hexane that you have to use to get the fat out of the soybean is so toxic. Um, so you're looking at, you know, a huge refining plant, sort of what, you know, similar to the process that we use to make gasoline out of petroleum. Um, 
Now the refining process isn't really the problem, right? I mean, the hexane is removed from it, but unfortunately what's left is, can be quite toxic in your body. And I've heard a different, or um, I read a study that was talking about linoleic acid and how long it stays in your body. Like the half-life is something like over 600 days, whereas stearic acid, which is the fatty acid that's in beef only stays in your body for like two days, something like that. Is there, uh, that or? well, that, so what they're talking about is in adipose tissue, right? In your fat cells. Right. Um, so it takes about, yeah, the half-life is basically how long does, would it take for half of the linoleic acid in your fat cells to be removed if you weren't eating any, right? And that's about 680 days. Um, so it takes a while when you're consuming a lot of linoleic acid for it to build up. And that's true for every fat. It's not particularly linoleic acid, although there's variation between two fats. Steric, you know, steric is a natural fat that's found in beef and in chocolate and your body actually makes it and converts it into other fat and stores it. So it's, you know, probably about the same half-life, but mm. the difference between steric and, uh, what it what it's converted to in the body, which is mainly oleic acid, which is the fat in olive oil, and linoleic acid, is that linoleic acid breaks down into these toxins in your body, and stearic doesn't. So, mm -hmm. if you have a lot of saturated or monounsaturated fats in your body, that's what you're supposed to have, right. and they're pretty stable, and they don't break down into the same toxins that these omega six polyunsaturated fats do. And if people are starting to read labels and just become more aware of the canola oils, the soybean oils that are in some of these products out there, and they come across high oleic acid uh, or high oleic soybean oil or high oleic canola oil. What does that actually mean? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well they're better, right? Uh, yeah. That's kind of funny as there's a scientist, Tom Brenna, who has done a lot of research on this. He said, when you read high oleic, what they're really saying is low linoleic acid, right? Industry is well aware of the problems with these fats. Uh, they cause all sorts of problems in cooking. And I mean, the best example is they, they have a problem where, you know, if you take, you know, they use these fats in fryers and restaurants. And as you're frying the fat, evaporates and coats everything in the restaurant, including your clothing. And then when they send the clothing out to be laundered, they have this problem where this sounds crazy, you know, on a hot day, the heat will cause the fats to burst into flames. <laughs> That's what we mean by an unstable fat easily yeah. subject to oxidation. And I mean, you know, when I was a kid growing up and we were doing furniture projects, you know, everybody knew that you don't use linseed. If you're using linseed oil and you have a rag that's coated with linseed oil, that it will burst into flames if you leave it in the sun. And you can find YouTube videos showing that. Well, these are basically the same types of fats that we're eating. Um, wow. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I lost my train of thought there. What was, what was the question again? Yeah, I was, I was just asking about reading labels and like, a lot of yep. these labels will now have high oleic acid, whether it's high oleic canola oil or vegetable oil, whatever it is, but. Yeah. So high oleic, what they've done is they've either found a naturally occurring variety of the seed, or they've genetically modified a seed so that it has lower linoleic acid and higher oleic acid, more of the safe fats. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely a better option, right? And places like the Harvard School of Public Health are finally starting to like publish papers saying, oh yes, oleic acid is better for you. Why is it better for you? Well, they don't come out and say because it's low in the linoleic acid that they've been telling you you should be consuming, right? They're just saying, oh, well, it doesn't cause oxidative damage. Um, okay, well, what causes oxidative damage? The linoleic acid, right? So Industry is trying to produce better fats, safer fats that are better to be used in like a fryer 
because they last longer, they don't mm -hmm. break down into these toxins. Um, I mean, you can find papers in the literature showing that uh, French fries fried in seed oils, which is what most of them are fried in, break down into this toxin HNE. And, you know, HNE is implicated in irritable bowel syndrome, in colitis, in colon cancer, you know, so it's definitely something you want to be avoiding in the quantities where most Americans are consuming it. it. It itself is an obesogen. It makes you, it causes obesity in animals and probably in humans. Harvard published a paper years ago showing that the most obesogenic food in the United States was potatoes fried in seed oils, mm -hmm. not potatoes on their own, right? Only potatoes fried in seed oils. Mm. So I yeah, also... you want to look, you want to look for, you know, you want to avoid seed oils if, I mean, if you're a vegetarian and you're trying to look for the best option and you're not going to be eating beef tallow, then a high oleic oil is definitely better than, you know, a high oleic sunflower oil is going to be better than just regular sunflower oil. Mm -hmm. Also, for anyone that hasn't tried potatoes or fries cooked in tallow, they need to get on that because it's the best type of potato I've ever had. I'm sure you found that to be similar, um, which yeah. leads me to my next question, Tucker. When you think about cooking for yourself, your family, friends, et cetera, what, what cooking fats or oils do you, do you like, or do you rely on? Cause you hear a lot of, you hear a lot of back and forth on, oh, you, you know, if olive oil is from a good source, single source farm, you can use it or stay away from it. Just, just curious your thoughts on all that. Um, I mostly use butter, um, butter. some coconut fat, um, and olive oil. I keep, like a 16 ounce jar of olive oil in the kitchen. And that'll last me about a year. Mm -hmm. I don't cook with it. Um, the problem with the, the two problems with olive oil. One is that just naturally the amount of linoleic acid in olive oil can vary from 2% to 22%, right? Just because of different environments that the plant's growing in. Um, the second problem and the more significant one so, you, you know, olive oil is pretty stable fat. If you're going to use olive oil, it's one of the more stable fats. So I just prefer not to use it because, you know, olive oil typically has a pretty strong taste when you're cooking with it. Um, and I, the other problem is that there's a huge problem with fraud in the olive oil market. Mm -hmm. You know, olive oil is very expensive. It's hard to produce. You know, I mean, soybean oil, you can plant soy plants every season and they grow like weeds. Olive trees take decades to come to production, you know, so it's not like you can ramp up your olive oil production easily. Right. So they, a lot of producers solve this problem by just adulterating it with cheaper, less healthy fats. Um, and I've, University of California, Davis did a study years ago and they found that 80% of the olive oil on the market was adulterated olive oil mm. cut with seed oils. And, you know, since, um, even Harvard is coming along now and telling us that oleic acid is the healthy fat. Uh, you know, why, why throw your money away on a fat that's likely to be adulterated? The olive oil industry has, I will say, to give them credit, responded with a certification program so that you can go find mm. olive oils that have been tested. Um, Mark Sisson's um, olive oil, for instance, is on that list. Uh, Primal Kitchen is the brand. And then there's California Olive Oil Company tests their olive oils to certify that it's not adulterated, but a lot of them aren't. So, yeah. you know, buyer beware. Tucker, it seems like the the messaging around seed oils has been getting a fair amount of pushback. And you, you mentioned it, it seems like it's coming from some of the medical communities. What's like the current conversations that are being happen that are happening? now around seed oils and like where are you guys getting the most pushback when you start talking about some of the benefits of getting rid of some of these seed oils well it's the vegan community um in a nutshell which is unfortunately a large part of the cardiology community and the uh quote-unquote nutrition science community um and a lot of what they do is misrepresent science um I mean, I gave, you know, I gave the example of this Harvard study where they 
took a look at it. They did this huge study, the nurses health study, and then two follow on studies looking at how diet relates to disease. And they looked at what causes obesity in the American diet. And it was overwhelmingly potatoes cooked in um, seed oils. But they didn't say that, right? And they fudged the data so that it wasn't so obvious. And then in the text, when they describe what's happening to these potatoes to take a normal boiled potato, which is not particularly obesogenic, to turn it into highly obesogenic French fries, I mean, you don't need a PhD to figure that one out, right? You can just look at the recipes. And I did a post on my blog, What's the Most Fattening Food, where I did exactly that. And the difference between French fries and a boiled potato is salt and seed oils, right? So something about those two ingredients takes it from being essentially not obesogenic to six or seven times as obesogenic as normal foods. Um, but they don't say that. What they said specifically was, oh, it's the increase in carbohydrate content. Well, if you're going from a baked, from a boiled potato to French fries, you are not increasing the carbohydrate content. That's just a lie. You are increasing the fat content and the fat is the seed oils that we are frying them in. So, you know, and I've got a whole series of other examples from that group where, you know, they're not as I, I even reached out to a famous statistician trying to get his viewpoint on what they are doing. And he described it as cheating, mm -hmm. right? They're fudging the numbers. They're using the statistics so they can hide what these fats are doing to us because for whatever reason, partly the fact that they're being funded by the seed oil industry, um, but also I think because they have a in, off, in a lot of cases, they have a religious motivation um, behind pushing vegetable fats and trying to replace animal fats with vegetable fats in the diet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, something, something, Tucker, we talk a lot about is just like the pervasiveness of just corn and soy with a lot of these, just these, these animals like chicken and pigs and things like that. Um, is that something that you're that you're mindful of? Are you very intentional about where you source your animal? Do you eat more red meat versus chicken, pigs, et cetera? Um, just, just curious about that. Yeah, there's a great study um, that was done by the National Institutes of Health, of all people, um, after they demonstrated that linoleic acid causes obesity. They then looked at what happens with farm-fed salmon, right? So mm -hmm. salmon's great food, high in omega-3 fats. Um, Farm-fed salmon is typically fed soybean meal, which alters mm -hmm. the fatty acid composition of the salmon and increases the omega-6 fats. So they looked at what that does to the salmon and then they ground up the salmon and fed it to mice. And feeding salmon soybean fat or soybean meal makes the salmon fattier. And then when you feed it to the mice, it makes the mice sick and fattier. Right. So the exact same thing happens with chicken and pork. So, yeah, I eat virtually no chicken. I do eat chicken eggs. I try to get pastured eggs because hopefully they have a better fatty acid composition. And I don't eat much in the way of the pork because the omega six uh, content, because, you know, again, when you're just like humans, non-ruminant animals like a chicken or a pig concentrate omega-6 fats the more you feed them and yeah so i you know the leading source surprisingly the leading source of linoleic acid in the american diet is chicken mm -hmm. <laughs> including fried chicken which of course is fried in seed oils oh, so gosh. yeah the the collection of problems here is so fascinating when it, when you start to dig deeper because you have real foods that people are trying to eat to become healthier, but they don't even realize that some of these things have higher linoleic acid content because they're fed corn and soy. And then you have the processed food industry, which by and large is using canola oil as something to cheapen the cost and also raise the fat content and make it have some nutritional label that they can like um, throw on right. there. So it's, it, it really is, uh, we talk about this a bunch. There's some, some ignorance around food in general, like just, just being able to get to a basic level of understanding, like really isn't enough in today's world with all the options of food that there are out there. Um, 
and that's why we're, we're such big proponents of just talking about eating real foods, like getting back to the point where real foods is the staple of your diet. Um, cause all the, the food, the food industry, it's, it's like, if you're really eating a, a bunch of processed food or not aware of some of the, the stuff that's getting uh, fed to your animals, it can be detrimental to your health. Yeah. And I mean, they've, you know, I've seen one of the markers of cardiovascular disease risk is this thing called LP little a. Um, the, pretty much the definition of LP little a is that it contains oxidized seed oils. Um, and it's a, I think the best marker that we have for heart disease risk. So how do you, <laughs> if you want to lower your LP little a, as I learned from talking to a woman on Twitter, she was eating mostly pork and she switched to beef and her, what she thought genetically high LPA, LP little a levels dropped in half in short order. And there are studies where they've done that, where they've, you know, shown that pork fat causes pork fat because it's high in linoleic acid because of what they're feeding the animals goes into your body and it oxidizes in your body and causes, you know, this LPA and is essentially turning your blood toxic, which is, sounds like a ridiculous thing to say, but it happens to be what's going on. Mm. Which is incredibly important for many people to know because there are a lot of carnivore influencers that don't talk about this and they'll say that you can eat as many bacon and eggs as you want. So understanding this data is incredibly important and making sure that, you know, animal base is amazing, but make sure that you're structuring that off a really clean source for generative red meat, you know, as, as nature intended. Right. Cause I mean, you know, wild animals, which is what we were obviously eating for most of our history, <laughs> typically have super low levels of omega-6 fats. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 of one to one to, you know, two to one, three to one, maybe um, in animals, it's can be up to 30 to one. Um, I mean, I just got a dog. <laughs> so I was reviewing dog foods the other day. Oh my and gosh. the recommendation that I found for dog food was a ratio of omega six to omega three of 30 to one, right? Well, gee, guys, guess what? We have an obesity problem in dogs too. You know, 60% of dogs and cats are obese. And we're feeding them the same processed junk that we're feeding them ourselves. Mm -hmm. High carb, high omega six, low in healthy natural fats and we're getting the same result yeah i uh there's a clemenza sorry to cut you off but there's okay. I, so tucker i live in san diego and there's a gentleman that's like right next to my building that owns this raw dog food company and so i just i just stopped in there because i was just curious how he was sourcing his meat just learning more about his philosophy and he was blowing my mind telling me these statistics about just the corruption in the in the pet industry that people don't know about and I guess, you know, a few decades ago, the average age of a dog in the U.S. was like 17, 18 years of age, which is insane to think about now where it's like, you know, you're lucky to get 10 to 12 years with your dog. And, you know, you start to you look into the diet and how this raw foods trend is now picking up. Yet so many people think it's insane to switch to an animal based diet for humans. So I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. And you read the same nonsense in the veterinary literature as you do in the human foods literature. I mean, I found a paper a while, or I found a veterinary dietary recommendation for cat food a while ago. And they were talking about how important it is to make sure that your cat gets enough carbohydrates. Okay, well, let's talk science, kids. What's the amount of carbohydrate that a wild cat or a wild dog gets? It's two to 1%, right? Yeah. They are not evolved to eat high amounts of carbohydrates we're not, we're more evolved than they are, but it causes health problems in humans too. Um, and if you take an animal that's supposed to be getting mostly protein and animal fats and you switch it to carbohydrates and seed oils, you make them sick, whether it's us or the cat or the dogs and the cats. And this is like rudimentary, you would think science. Um, you would think. Yeah. Tucker, are, are you, um, what would be your actionable advice for people who are trying to just get, break away from sort of the standard mold of, of eating in America? Because 
there's so many things like I, I'm thinking about as you're, as you're talking about, um, as you're talking about like animals and, and how unhealthy they are now, I'm thinking they're spending so much more time outside on grasses that are sprayed with glyphosate and that same sort of, of uh, chemicals that are in a lot of the corn and soy are also being sprayed on grasses that these animals are, are spending most of their time on when they go outside and how detrimental that is to their health. And are there other like little things that you would adjust in the way we eat that would make the biggest difference um, in our own underlying health? Well, I would address the low hanging fruit, right? Mm -hmm. If you're worried about toxins in your diet, pesticides in general should be way, way, way down the list, right? Mm -hmm. um, even something like glyphosate, the amount of glyphosate that you get in processed food is minute right? Mm -hmm. The amount of vegetable oil, seed oils that you get in processed food is very high. Yeah, I particularly am super gluten intolerant, right? And apparently seven, at least 7% of the population has a significant problem digesting gluten, including a lot of dogs and cats who obviously did not evolve eating wheat. Um, those for most people are the two easiest ways to get toxins out of your diet and will be, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of times more toxin in your diet than most pesticides. So I like organic food, you know, organic milk to me tastes a lot better than regular milk. So I tend to mm -hmm. drink that fruits and vegetables. I can't really taste the difference. And if you look at, you know, the actual tests, I mean, yeah, they're coming out of the USDA, but um, you know, they do do a lot of testing for pesticides, pesticide residues and fruits and vegetables, and they're typically pretty low. Um, even the independent testing finds they're pretty low. So, you know, the flip side is if you're eating what I would call a healthy human diet, like I do, where I'm avoiding most grains, um, you're not going to get a lot of the things that they're spraying glyphosate on. Right. Right. I hardly ever eat corn. Um, you know, once in a while I'll have, you know, corn chips or, you know, a corn taco, uh, cause I can't eat wheat tacos. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my consumption of that stuff is so low that I don't even, I don't even worry about it. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's to all the people, you know, my wife was a huge proponent of organic foods. She went to enormous lengths she was near vegan. She had her own organic garden. She raised almost all of her food herself in her own garden. And she was very sick. Mm -hmm. And by switching her diet to a more evolutionarily appropriate one, she lost, she put her fibromyalgia into remission in weeks and lost 56 pounds in two and a half months. Wow. Right. Going from a super organic vegetarian diet to, you know, basically supermarket paleo, if you want to call it that. Wow. It's amazing. It's, it's really incredible to, to just hear these anecdotal stories and experiences. Um, something that we tweeted the other day, Tucker, is we were, we were commenting on these individuals that have an outsider perspective and what they've done to kind of help our understanding of nutrition. So like in particular engineers and journalists. So you see like engineers like Dave Feldman, what he's done with the lipid energy model. You see journalists like Gary Tobbs and Nina Teichels. They really have helped us properly understand our role of fat versus refined grains and sugars and you know why we are ultimately metabolically unhealthy as a country. And that mm -hmm. makes me think about you too with your background in finance and technology. Do you think that your background coming in as an outsider and not having a medical degree has really helped you with the work that you've done to understand seed oils and the role that it plays within Western society? Oh, unquestionably. I mean, I don't, you know, look, if you're a doctor going through medical school, basically your job is to memorize and regurgitate, right? Mm -hmm. It's not to think, mm -hmm. okay? Then you get out of medical school and you have an enormous debt load and you have a leash around your neck, right? You have to go get board certified. And if you don't follow what they call the standard of care, they will take your license away and you'll be left with all the debt. <laughs> so 
you know, you're essentially a debt slave and you're not an independent actor any longer. So you can't, you know, it's really difficult. And we've seen a number of famous cases recently, like what happened to uh, Gary Fetke down in Australia and Tim Noakes in South Africa. And uh, before that, there was a woman in Sweden, her name escapes me right at the moment, where they were going off the reservation. And, you know, the diet, the dietitian community tried to crucify them. Um, and it turned out when the science was reviewed, they were right, but they still had to go through the process of getting crucified before they came out the other side. So I'm not beholden to that. I can call the facts as they are. And, you know, what's amazing is a lot of what I'm doing is just reading the medical research. I'm reading what these people publish and just turning around and tweeting the results of their studies and discussing the results of their studies and saying, well, look, this is what it says. This is what they say it says. Or in some cases, like with, you know, Harvard, well, this is what they should say it says, but they won't. Gee, let's mm -hmm. let's look at the funding conflicts of interest. Oh, they're being funded by a seed oil company. Maybe that's why they don't want to say that the most obesogenic food in America is something with seed oils in it. You know, I can do that. And you know what? That's my background. I came from Wall Street where I was part of the fraud detection team. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. my job was going through and saying okay you say this are you doing that does your data support your conclusion no oh okay well then you're a crook yeah Do, um I was gonna ask um are you spending all of your time on, on this is this your full-time role right now We're, like kind of approaching this because uh, well <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious. Uh, it, you've spent so much time on it, and I see all of your work on it. It's amazing. Is this what you're doing full time? At the moment, yes. Um, I am very lucky to be a consultant for a company called Zero Acre Farms, uh, which is a startup that is in the business of uh, <clears throat> trying to produce a better alternative to seed oils than what we have in the market. Um, and you know, doing that consulting as allowed me to spend time on this full time. Um, I don't know how much, you know, I'm also working on doing a lot of writing and writing a book and all that. And, you know, so we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Um, but yeah, for years, it was just a hobby. Um, and now it's kind of taken off. And, you know, it used to be just me being a crank on Twitter. And now as more and more people have started looking into the research, you know, it's becoming obvious to more and more people that there's something really going on here. Mm -hmm. Are you, so, um, are, Tucker, are you surprised at all at the, at the almost like the mainstream traction that we've seen with the, with the average consumer starting to wake up to how pervasive these seed oils are? Um, is that like, was that kind of on par with what you were thinking the the timeline it was going to take? Well, uh, I mean, it, it's amazing. <laughs> But I'm not really surprised because we've seen this happen before, right? I mean, I remember 10 years ago, I was sitting in New York with a bunch of paleo people and they were talking about how hard it was going to be to make gluten-free a thing. And I asked them all a question and I said, how many of you smoke or know somebody who smokes? Mm -hmm. And they were all like, nobody, nobody smokes. Everybody knows it's bad for you. And I was like, okay, 50 years ago, everybody smoked. Right. Yeah. And now if you look, you know, I recently joined Costco and I went into Costco and I was blown away. You can be paleo eating in a Costco and they have gluten free foods all over the place. And when we had that conversation all those years ago, the idea of being able to go into a big box retailer and have a plethora of gluten free options was just that was like the dream. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of the reason, a lot of people say the paleo movement failed. No, it won. It won. Yeah. And this is like the last piece of it, right? This is, there was nobody pushing seed oils as a problem the way that I've been doing it. Stefan Guillenay was doing it for a while and then he kind of abandoned it, which is a long story why that happened. But, you know, this is the last piece of making paleo style eating what I would call healthy human diet available to everybody right we need the op we need the options I mean 
getting rid of wheat is easy compared to getting rid of seed oils for a lot of these food products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a much, it's a much more complicated story. I mean, you know, seed oils, you know, celiac is a disease where the recognized problem causing it is wheat consumption. And then there are people like me who aren't celiac, but have celiac sensitivity. And, you know, we're the bulk of the people who are eating gluten free. Yeah. And seed oils, you know, the literature showing harm has been out there since the 1960s, right? But for political and religious reasons has been ignored. Mm -hmm. It's a great point because if you go out to eat at a restaurant, it's fairly easy to ask your waiter or waitress to verify if the menu options are gluten-free. And if they don't know, they do a quick check into the kitchen and they get you an answer in 10 seconds. Yep. You know, when it comes to seed oils, they don't even, there's almost no way for them to verify where they actually might think that they're cooking with pure butter, but it's really some type of a margarine mixture and they have no idea at all. Right. Yep. It's a lot, it's a lot tougher, but you know, I'm, I mean, we have zero acre, right? They got, you know, and one of the amazing things about that story is they started off with an economic and an ecological message that, you know, the production of vegetable oils is very harmful to the environment. And when they started talking to investors, the investors were saying, well, what about the health benefits? <laughs> right? It's out yeah. there. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, we've gotten ourselves so on the hook of getting a lot of our calories from vegetable oils, it's going to be tough to switch. Hmm. Yeah, Tucker, if you had to put your profit- Individually, it's easy, right? But as if you're talking about the whole country or the whole world, it's going to be tough. Yeah, it almost needs to be a grassroots movement in a lot of ways. Is that how you view this going forward? The, yeah, the government, the government will never fix it for us. They're too beholden to political and religious interests. Um, the corporations don't care what they sell you. They are also beholden to government regulators. But at the end of the day, they will follow what the market wants them to do. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you sell food with a lot of saturated fat in it, it's literally un illegal to label it as healthy. You can only do that if you're including seed oils, right? But we will get to the point, I think, where the corporations, you know, where people will just be like, okay, well, gee, the government's lying to us again. <laughs> that never happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, honestly, the last couple of years has been a huge help in that regard, because yeah. it used to be kind of crazy to say that, you know, I mean, a lot of people have pointed out that the number of conspiracy theories that we find out keep coming true in the last couple of years. It's been like, OK, so they really do want to inject a chip into your body so they can track you. Gee, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And this, you know. This vegetable oil thing, by comparison, is pretty mundane because, uh, you know, as I said, we've got hundreds of thousands of studies in the medical literature showing the harms of this. They have conferences, journalish, journal, you know, entire journal articles dedicated to these problems. Yeah. Well, Tucker, what I appreciate, but what I appreciate about your work is I think that there's a lot of people out there who are just coming around to this, and I think your ability to speak at all levels of the food chain when it comes to talking about seed oils is amazing like i all any you. of my any of my friends who are interested in learning more about seed oils I'll, i'm just going to send them this episode so they can at least start to think about it a little bit more and how how they should be trying to avoid them and how pervasive they are in all of our food so i think your messaging is is great so thanks for all, all thank you for that it. thanks yeah i try i mean i never looked to be pursuing a career in public speaking which i frankly makes me sick to my stomach <laughs> but uh you know it's it's amazing to see how this message has taken off i mean you know it's amazing that you can push and push and get so many people to start thinking about this you know doctors and scientists and then regular folks you know it's it's really an amazing it's been an amazing process yeah well i would be prepared if i were you to be doing much more public speaking especially as this stuff comes more mainstream i think there's going to be a lot of organizations and institutions that are going to want you to speak to this so um tucker what's the best oh, way 
Yeah, what's, what's the best way for, <laughs> for people to connect with you and just learn more about the work that you're doing? Well, I've uh, got a blog with thousands of posts, um, yelling-stop.blogspot.com. Um, I'm uh, very active on Twitter, at Tucker Goodrich. And I have a podcast, as I mentioned, there are links to it on my blog and it's on YouTube. You know, if you Google Tucker Goodrich, it'll come up. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. This was a great combo. We'll, um, we'll make sure to share it uh, wide and far and uh, get this message out there because I think the anti-seed oil message is a good one. Great. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's a pleasure. Thanks, awesome. Tucker. Tucker.